Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone from all around the globe. My name is Eric Mayo, and I'll be helping moderate today's webinar on quantitative systems pharmacology with Julia. Today, you will learn how to leverage the world's best differential equations library, obtain 10x to 300x speed gains while running simulations, scale Julia code on CPUs or GPUs with just four lines of code, build models in the cloud on Julia Hub, for instance, or in other HPC environments. And uh, QSP with Julia ultimately reduces your time to discovery and your organization's time to market. We'd like to have this an interactive session today, so please write your questions in the chat window and we will either address them on the fly or address each question individually following the demonstration. With that said, it's my pleasure to introduce today's presenter for our QSB webinar, Dr. Matt Bauman. Over the last seven years, Matt has been a contributor to the Julia language, is currently the Director of Applications Engineering, and wears many hats within the organization. Some of his credits include the creator of our learning center, Julia Academy. Matt is a Julia class instructor, technical support engineer, and software developer having made over 500 contributions to the Julia language within the last year. We're also joined today by Dr. BJ Ivaturi from Puma's AI. BJ is an ISOP board member, an assistant professor of pharmacy, practice and science at, at the University of Maryland Baltimore School of Pharmacy and the chief scientific officer at Puma's AI. BJ will be available for the audience today to ask in-depth questions on QSP. Please welcome Dr. BJ Avaturi and Dr. Matt Bauman. Matt? Thanks so much, Eric. Thanks everyone for being a part of this webinar. I'm excited to show you all some of the latest work that we've been doing and, and in particular, the work that we've been doing to make it as easy as possible to scale and, and build out the, your QSP models in Julia. Uh, now, of course, we're leveraging the Julia programming language. For those of you who are new to the language or just understanding, I'm going to give lay a little bit of foundation here, uh, but we'll be up and running on QSP in, in no time at all. So the Julia programming language is a modern programming language designed from the ground up to be fast and expressive. And it's not just us that's finding it to be fast and expressive. It's, you know, folks throughout industry. Uh, there's recently a really awesome article in Ars Technica, as well as academia, where there's an article from Nature. Both of these articles kind of target the, the combination of being fast and expressive and seeing how this is enabling whole new kinds of libraries and applications and models. So Julia was first released in 2012 to the public uh, and has been growing ever since rapidly. And now more and more frequently, I'm seeing folks on you know Stack Overflow and forums saying, hey, I want to access these state-of-the-art libraries that are in a Julia language, how, to, how do I do it? Uh, we, now have an extraordinarily robust and mature package ecosystem that folks are seeing as, as being first in class amongst all programming languages. So looking to interface Julia with their existing, uh, existing languages because of our awesome package ecosystem. And the reason for this is because Julia solves the two language problem. We'll talk a little bit about what this looks like throughout during this presentation. Uh, but the, the idea is that because it's a fast and expressive language, it means that no longer do you need to rely on compiling to another language to do your, you know, the the fast inner loops of your of your models to actually implement the the routines that you're using whether you're a user or a developer, it doesn't matter. Julia is, is there with the speed and expressivity that you need. So this has led to robust uh, and, and quick adoption with over a million downloads a month. Uh, and it's a dynamic language uh, uh, and of course open source. So this means that you know, when you go to develop a model in Julia, for example, this little uh, small example of a, of a Gillespie simulation for uh, epidemiological modeling means that you can implement a textbook algorithm very straightforward. It's an expressive language that looks like the algorithm. 
uh, and it allows you to very directly, uh, you know, implement exactly what you want in in Julia, uh, enabling you know really nice and easy uh, implementations. Uh, so this allows you to to write what you want, but then of course. What's just as important is that these, these models that you develop are fast. So in this small epidemiological model, you can see that you know, using uh, R or you know, the, the standard R package, we're talking about a, a second per simulation to, to evaluate this particular model. Now you can speed up R, right, with RCPP, and that's effectively using another language in conjunction with R to, to speed things up, and, and that is totally possible, but it requires a second language, and there you're able to get it on the order of a thousand-fold speed up, which is kind of wild. Just using Julia directly, though, gives you that exact same performance. Uh, so straightforward use, Julia also has a Gillespie package, but it also has an awesome differential equations solver suite. And you can implement this either way. Both ways are you know, within the, the best in class kind of performance of C++. Uh, and so this is where Julia is really excelling is the ability to write these, these algorithms in, in an expressive way um, that is understandable to, to scientists and engineers and computer scientists alike, uh, but then also has the speed that you want. This translates into the differential equations ecosystem. So this chart is kind of wild and, and huge and, and complicated, uh, but it's kind of a survey of the differential equations ecosystem of lots of different languages, lots of different implementations, uh, everything basically that is available. Um, and so the way to read this chart is the columns are each implementation of a particular differential equation solver suite. Uh, and the rows describe different features of, of those suites. So for example, you know, you could look at complex number support across all of these uh, these solver ecosystems. And, and sure enough, you can see that MATLAB does an excellent job with complex numbers, as you would hope it would, given that basically the core data structure in MATLAB is an array of complex numbers. Differential equations.jl is this fourth column here. And, and sure enough, we have good support for complex numbers built in. Uh, but you can see that this is holds true across nearly every, you know, every uh, feature that we, we looked at here, that the differential equations solver suite is, is has grown and is built on this. And one of the ways in which we've validated this, this solver su suite is by connecting it. So Julia itself has really awesome interoperability, which means that you can actually run Sundial's code through the different Julia differential equation solver system. Uh, and through that API, you just say, hey, I want to use a Sundial solver. Uh, and the, your code looks exactly the same. Uh, it's just talking to a different solver. Uh, and so this allows us to do this kind of benchmarking and feature evaluation uh, across lots of languages very, very effectively. What this means and kind of the, the summary of that table is that we're able to see three different layers of acceleration when it comes to implementing your models in Julia, right? There's the fact that Julia itself is a modern language and is itself fast and expressive. It sits atop a, a modern compiler framework, the same compiler framework that Apple and Google use for, for their, uh, their languages. It rivals or even beats the speed of C, Fortran, or C++, these kind of historically hard and fast languages. I, in short, what this means is that the code that you write can be fast. It applies to your own functions. It applies to your own for loops. You no longer need to be afraid of for loops, for example. And it applies to the libraries that you use that are implemented in Julia. And because Julia itself is fast and expressive, it's enabled rapid algorithm design and development within our libraries. So the logo here, that is the logo of Julia's differential equations solver suite. And because Julia is that high level language, it has meant that the 
differential equations authors have been able to go about and kind of collect up all of the different integration techniques that have been published in the last 30 years, bring in the new, uh, you know, the latest developments from research uh, and make them production ready, make them available in a production system. Uh, and the way they've been able to bring in these hundreds of solvers, last I counted, there was over 300, uh, was because it's written in Julia, right? And because it looks like the math and because it's easy to implement, it means that we can just plug in more and more integrators as they come. And so not only do we get a fast language, but we can also, you know, even in cases where, you know, the existing models are leveraging uh, you know, the fast traditionally compiled languages or doing some multi-language solution, we can often even beat them there because we can do something smarter when it comes to integrating a differential equation. Lastly, there's the fact that parallelism is built and, and fully incorporated into Julia. This applies not just to multi-threading, which is a core feature built into Julia and available to users, it also applies to multi-node compute uh, where, or cluster compute, where you want to distribute a job across a whole cluster of computers. And it also applies to computers that have uh, you know, beefy GPUs attached to them. So GPU compute is also available in, and combinations thereof. Uh, so you know, we actually support using multi-threads across many machines, across many GPUs, and all three layers of those parallelism is available to you as a user. And perhaps more importantly, it's built in fundamentally to the differential equation solvers, where a single flag says, hey, I want to evaluate this solver, this, this suite of solves, or potentially this, you know, virtual population, uh, uh, generation across many computers or across a GPU, a, a single flag kind of opts into that. Uh, and so that's, that's where we can see this. So this all comes together once we start talking about QSP. And I, I'm sure you're all very familiar with this paper to, documenting the six stage support. And, and we aim to, to support all six stages of this workflow through Julia and what I'll demonstrate in, the, in a minute on Julia Hub. Before I, I go into my demo, I want to just talk a little bit about some of the results that we're seeing specifically for QSP sorts of projects. So we've done a number of case studies across uh, the pharma industry and, and looked at different models implemented in different ways, translating them to Julia, seeing how well we can do and seeing how, how much of a speed up we can get. Uh, and, and really the speed ups that we see kind of depend upon what's happening and, and you know how much blood, sweat, and tears has been poured into the existing model. So for example, this the first two rows here were a, a standard cardiac model, uh, you know, written and implemented in, in pure MATLAB, hadn't done any, you know, MATLAB compiler or, or, or translation. Uh, and there, you know, had a really nice 25-fold speed up. That's just language speed up there. Uh, being able to leverage a faster language means that we can, can see uh, awesome speed ups here. Of course, then we can parallelize this, right? And, and depending upon the, the framework, you know, the, the upper end here is the sky's the limit. This is just using six cores as compared to one core. And, and sure enough, you see nearly exactly a 6x speed up over the, the single threaded answer. The bottom two rows here are the Tuari Beard model published by Pfizer. I translated that into Julia. And here, this was you know, a production model that had been optimized and, and rewritten uh, to more efficiently call into Sundial solvers. And so there, there wasn't too much of the language side, right? They had already addressed the language side by doing a lot of the work to, to rewrite, re-implement it in a, in a harder language. Uh, and uh, uh, even so, we were able to see a nice twofold speed up on the algorithmic side of things, right? Because we can use leverage more advanced algorithms, uh, we can see uh, a nice speed up there. The ones that I'll focus on here are the three highlighted in green, where you know we looked at a uh, production model. This is a model that's still under embargo, hoping to be published shortly. 
uh, where we, uh, you know, this is a production model that they, again, had the, the scientists working in MATLAB and translating it over to a, a production team that converted it into C and, and compiled it down. And then, you know, I worked with it there. And, and again, see a, a nice sevenfold speed up. I, and that's, again, that algorithmic difference, choosing a different integrator that can, in this case, respond to bolus discontinuities uh, much more effectively. Whereas the, the traditional integrators for differential equations tend to want to throw away all history once they see a big discontinuity. Well, there's things about the system that remain constant that you've learned, that you understand, and there are newer integrators that can, uh, newer solvers that can take advantage of that. Uh, and you know, don't need to resample quite so uh, tightly after a bolus input, for example. And so here, you know, even compared to this, you know, highly optimized MATLAB converted to C, converted into sundials, we were able to see a sevenfold algorithmic difference. And again, with a single flag, linear scaling across the number of cores, huge scaling once we moved to GPUs to simulate 10,000 simultaneous ODEs uh, at, at once. So again, this, this model encapsulated 14 ODEs fitting 56 parameters across a large virtual population. And the workflow challenges were significant before moving to Julia, right? They, every modification to these ODEs required translation and recompilation into C and, and a huge cost. And in fact, uh, you know, this, this workflow challenge really affected productivity. Right, where the, you ended up with two versions of, of the code. Uh, which one is the canonical one? Is it the C code? Is it the MATLAB code? The MATLAB is easy for scientists to iterate on, but hard to, to uh, you know, actually get results from uh, and vice versa. So this is where, where Julia really shines. And I wanna show a little bit of a demo about how we're envisioning a, a full-fledged QSP model workflow uh, for you on Julia Hub. So with that, I'm going to jump out here to Julia Hub. Uh, this is juliahub.com. It's available you know, to you as, as uh, end users. You can log in, enter a credit card, and you gain access to these compute capabilities. Uh, and not only do we have juliahub.com available, but we also have Julia Hub Enterprise, which allows you to embed this system within your, uh, your, your company, uh, giving you security, uh, peace of mind, and, and integrated billing and, and direct access to everything. But we'll see how this looks first before we dig into that. So Julia Hub is a great place to explore the package ecosystem. So we can go in and, and look for you know, all the uh, differential equations, li libraries are all the packages tagged differential equations, see them, explore through them, find the different you know, documentation on, on how to use them effectively and, and whatnot. It's all a single point of contact here. But what I wanna talk about today is how you actually run your code. Uh, and that's as simple as going to the applications tab where you can uh, launch an application. Uh, to spin up potentially Julia in the cloud to, uh, to build your models, right? And so I can go in here and say, let's launch a Julia IDE for us to, to work with interactively develop this code uh, and, and see what this looks like. So I can choose exactly what kind of machine I want to work on uh, and the cost is just based upon you know what I'm, I'm spinning up in the cloud. Uh, this is an entirely cloud-based workflow, an entirely validated workflow. And so I can say, hey, I want a, a relatively large machine uh, to work on, or potentially even say, hey, let's use a machine that has a GPU attached to it. Uh, in this case, I don't need a GPU. And, and uh, so I'll just spin up a, uh, uh, you know, maybe a four core and eight core machine. And uh, you know, say, well, let's let's put a time out of eight hours here, make sure that uh, I can get my job, my work done for the day, uh, and limit my costs that way. 
So it's very easy to spin these up. I've actually already spun one up. And so of course I have this connect button here there where I can connect into my uh, existing workflow. And sure enough, here is Julia in my browser, uh, a fully full featured uh, interactive environment where I can go in and you know develop my code. You can see here on my screen, this is actually the Leucine model that we have. Uh, to uh, to demonstrate, and I can go in here, you know, examine the model, see what's happening, see, you know, what, uh, uh, you know, look at the the iterations, look at the best candidates, kind of play with this interactively. It's a really awesome environment and a full featured IDE where you know I can go in and I uh, you know look at look for help on different things, look for uh, all the different kinds of uh, IDE features that, that you want to be using. Uh, all of these are available for you as you edit your code and, and get things going. So I can, for example, go in here and say, all right, let's do a bunch of iterations across a bunch of subjects or potentially you know, change this to be, uh, let's say a, a virtual population of 10,000 subjects. And I wanna do you know, maybe 100,000 iterations for each subject. This is a very, very huge compute uh, heavy uh, task now, and, and it's highly parallelizable. Yeah, every, every subject can be done independently. And so that means that I can, instead of running this on a single node in my interactive workspace here, I can launch into what's called Julia Hub and connect back into the Julia Hub ecosystem from within my, my interactive session on Julia Hub. I can tell Julia Hub, hey, instead of starting an interactive task with just one machine attached to it, let's choose to, uh, within the Julia Hub tab here, I can choose to uh, start up a whole cluster, say, with maybe, let's do 50 nodes, uh, let's say, you know, four cores on each node. Uh, we'll start up a, a process for every core across every node. So that's going to be over 200 cores, 200 workers that can tackle this problem. Uh, and you can see a cost estimate here. If I wanted to, I could also run this on the GPU. Uh, and I can go in and start this job. I just say, hey, let's kick off this job. I you know, set my, my time out, make sure that I don't overspend my budget uh, based on you know, my uh, uh, expectations of how this job will run and hit submit. And sure enough, you can see on my, my jobs list here, I have this submitted model all ready to go uh, and uh, available for me to work with. So uh, as that's running, I can actually go in, watch the law logs come in live. Uh, right now, it'll just be spinning up to, uh, oops, interesting. Uh, right now, it'll just be spinning up to get the, uh, yeah, the, the machines are just still spinning up. And that's what's happening here is that the job actually hasn't started yet. Uh, so it's going out to AWS and, and building all these machines, getting them set up to, to connect to all my workers. Uh, and you can, can go in. And in fact, in Julia Hub, I can go in and look at it through the website as well, not just through my integrated development environment. This is all, all connected together. So here, again, you can see the submitted job of Lucene model. I can actually tag inputs and, and classify exactly what I'm running and such uh, and, and see them. So that's how we can work with this. Now, what's really cool is that we can go in and I grab out our results. So you can uh, go to a, a job that I ran earlier this morning. I submitted this and it's already complete. So I can go in and download the results file, open this up and you can see here, this was a, a job with 30, uh, 30 subjects and the parameter estim estimations of all 56 parameters here for all of my, all of my subjects. You can see them uh, all available to me. And, and it's just a, a straightforward CSV that I can load back into Julia, do some plotting with it, you know, examine what these plots look like and, and see what, uh, what happens. So that's all available to you here within your Julia Hub environment. Now, what's really cool is that I can go back to Julia Hub 
And I could introspect that model within VS Code, kind of do the standard Julia workflow, or I could potentially launch up a Pluto notebook environment. So I can go back here to my applications and spin up a Pluto notebook environment. Uh, the, the, now, Pluto notebooks are these really cool devices that are kind of like Jupyter notebooks, if you're familiar with them. It's an in, a, a very interactive, reactive sort of way of exploring your code, seeing what's available, seeing what, what you can do. Uh, and so we can launch these things. And, and just like before, when I launch this, I can choose how beefy of a machine I want to spin up. I can choose exactly how this will work. And then once it's open, I can connect to it. So I already have that up and running here. This is the, the Pluto notebook environment. I can start a new notebook or I can go in and, and see what is available to me. And so you can go in and interactively uh, and reactively develop your code, decide what code you want to, to run. And uh, here I have that, that Julia Hub table of runs that I've been working with. Uh, and so as I choose each model that I've run or different runs of the model, I can go in, introspect them, see what's happening, see what the differences within each one is. This is a fully reactive environment where you can go in, build your comprehensive graphs and, and dynamically and introspect the, the results, see what's happening there. Once you're happy with that, uh, you can actually publish this as a full uh, you know, user-friendly dashboard, right? So this is the uh, kind of the developer's view where you actually have a fully reactive uh, Julia environment here and you can type any Julia code and it'll, it'll happily execute it, give you your answer from simple arithmetic to plots to connecting with Julia Hub, right? This is a, a very developer-focused environment. You can hide the code, which makes it feel a little bit more dashboardy. But really, if you want to share these results to the world, well, you want to develop a nicer web entry point that is a little more secure, right? That doesn't support random folks from uh, for, our, for running arbitrary code. And, and the best way to do that is using uh, dash.jl or for dashboards. And we can actually do that through Julia Hub as well, where you can go in and pull up your applications and develop uh, the, the final output as a dashboard. Now, I don't have the, the, a nice example of the, the Lucene model, uh, integrating it together as a dashboard there. But what I do have is this uh, other dashboard uh, that you know looks at a large data set and, and sees what happens. And again, the same workflow applies. I, I just spin up an instance and, and can connect to it. Uh, once it's up and running, then I have access to this dashboard. And this is just a very simple example of what a dashboard looks like. The data here that this is the, this is grabbing and plotting isn't from from Julia Run. Rather, it's data that the New York Times has aggregated. It automatically downloads and updates it, and allows you to look at you know the COVID nineteen case counts across the United States, either throughout all states and territories. Uh, so you can look at you know the cumulative cases. You can change this to uh, daily cases and and see the. Uh, the entire United States, or you can go in and look, for example, within specific uh, jurisdictions, right? So we can go into New York City, uh, go into Illinois, Cook County is Chicago, go into California, uh, Los Angeles here, and those are the three largest cities in the United States. Uh, you're able to compare these, normalize by population, or look at the raw case counts. And these graphs here are fully interactive, fully reactive. You can zoom in on the last two months, uh, kind of look at, at each value, see how many cases per day they're averaging, change the, the rolling filter here. Uh, so it's an exact count. Uh, all these things are, are a lot of fun. Um, or I could say, let's look at the top 10 percentile of counties uh, in New York City, in the state of New York. Uh, and again, let's add some, some filtering here so I can you know, look at the top 10 counties and compare those to the bottom 90% uh, by population. 
Uh, so all of these things are, are available to you and you can, can play with them. Uh, really, really awesome way of, of exploring results, uh, be it public data, be it private data, right? This can, again, connect back into your Julia Hub run results as well to download those and introspect them as well, just like we did in that Pluto notebook. So all together, this is you know, how we're envisioning a complete workflow from interactive development of your model itself to deploying the validated job submission. Uh, and in fact, within the Julia Hub Enterprise version of Julia Hub, this can be in a completely validated and CFR Part 11 compliant system where you can go in and, and, and submit these jobs. And in fact, then you can go back and there's a complete log of exactly what jobs got submitted, exactly what code was submitted within, within each one. Uh, you can see exactly uh, you know, how many job files things were, the exact source that was run, the exact dependencies that were run, and it's fully reproducible. You can always go back to these and reproduce the exact same answer uh, based on the, um, the code that you were given. So this is how the, the workflow looks. Uh, we can go back to uh, my presentation just to, uh, for a few last slides and we can talk about how this looks uh, and then go into our discussion towards the end. So as I demonstrated, Julia Hub allows you to develop, uh, scale, introspect and deploy your models uh, and supports that entire workflow uh, where juliehub.com uh, on the left there is freely accessible and, and, and folks can sign up and, and start using it individually. Now that's not probably how, how your companies would be happy about you using company data. Uh, and, and for that, we have Julia Hub Enterprise, uh, which takes all the features from the public version of Julia Hub. And, and adds in enterprise support, uh, you know, the, the billing directly within uh, your AWS environment, potentially adding governance and security, and, and importantly, uh, adding uh, private package management where you can develop common sets of tools across your organization, collaborate on them, share those out and, and keep them private. Uh, so it allows private package management as well. Uh, all of these things tie together, allowing you to scale your pro programs nicely and easily. And this is all a part of, of what we're doing here at Julia Computing. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, you know, Julia Computing is the company that uh, has grown out of the the open source language, uh, kind of by demand, uh, as as the language itself has grown. The founders of the language uh, realized that we needed a corporate backing to ensure first class enterprise support uh, for the language and to build products such as Julia Hub, allowing you to easily scale uh, your models out. And uh, so we've been, been growing over the last five years, uh, targeting large segments uh, from pharmaceuticals to energy to medicine, uh, and have been uh, very, very happy with uh, how, how folks are finding Julian and think that this is a great solution for you all. So with that, I, I will uh, bring it back to our discussion where we can talk about you know, how, how this works and, and answer any questions. I, I see that there's a lot of activity on the chat so we can come to those or, or uh, other questions that folks have, uh, happy to answer them now. So uh, a good question here that I see, I can go back and, and look at uh, some of the, uh, the others, but the most recent question I see is uh, asking, can you do neural networks in Julia Hub? And the answer there is absolutely. So Julia Hub fully supports all of Julia's packages as well as supports you know, interconnection to other packages. So you can, of course, use flux.jl. Flux is our Julia native uh, neural network uh, engine and, and allows you to do that. Uh, and importantly, we're building atop of that a, a brand new, uh, you know, neural, uh, neural ODE or, or uh, 
yeah, the, the neural differential equations suite of, of systems where, uh, you know, there's active development in using neural networks within uh, differential equations. And, and some of that will uh, be available on Julia Hub first and, and only available on Julia Hub Enterprise, uh, at least initially as we develop it and, and get things going. So that's uh, some really exciting new development. But then of course you can also connect into uh, other languages. You can even connect into TensorFlow or PyTorch, for example, from, from Julia and those also work on Julia Hub. Yes, and, and as Eric notes in the chat, uh, you know, we can even put in, to build into a Julie Hub Enterprise environment, uh, things like our studio server, MATLAB, uh, your other tools that, that you are already leveraging uh, as you want to transition to Julia. We know that it's not going to be a, a cut and dry transition where uh, one day everyone else is out and Julia is in. Uh, it's gonna be you know, a, a, a slow development uh, and, and we're here to help support that. Uh, so there's another question about uh, you know teaching and free teaching aids for for students uh, deploying to I uh, so there's a, a, a other um, deployments such as Heroku uh, that allow you to deploy and and importantly Heroku is free for uh, small very very small uh, compute and in fact we do support that and in fact you can go out today and see that COVID dashboard that I have developed and hosted on Julia Hub. It's also available on Heroku. Uh, there are uh, some caveats there but uh, you can go to it, check it out and uh, that will um, you know spin up a, a Julia session for you. It takes a little bit to get started uh, just because of the way Heroku's free services work. They, they tear down their, their machines on demand and if nobody's accessed it within the last 30 minutes, uh, you, know, yeah, you need to reboot your machine. Uh, and so it uh, takes a second to, to launch here sometimes. Matt, I think there's a question uh, in response to, to my suggestion with regards to people in pharmacometrics and, and within the Julia Hub Enterprise capability. From A. Castleman, uh, are you limited to the number of cores for a single non-MEM license? Ah, uh, so if, you know, we, we work with you and, and develop non-MEM uh, to, you know, to be a part of your system, we are not, you know, that, that will be limited to, uh, the number of cores on a single machine. Um, that's kind of the way that we, we tackle that problem. Um, and, and of course, within your licensing arrangement with non-MEM, uh, that, that would be, you know, they, they also limit the, that and that's within the terms of their licensing. Uh, so we're restricted on, on what we can do there simply because it's a external group, right? We, they're, they're not uh, evaluated there uh, on the, the, the Julia side, the, uh, there's no limit. Uh, you, you can scale to your heart's content uh, and, and go up and out uh, and it'll you know, just be charged based upon the compute that you use. There's another question from Lemerve. Um, I have a question on the separation between Julia Hub and Julia. What's the difference mm -hmm. between running a Julia code on Julia Hub and running it on my own computers or clusters? So essentially what Julia Hub is doing here is bundling together uh, Julia for you in a single point of contact, kind of as your, your single entry point. So that means that, you know, when I have a Julia tab open here where I can work with it, uh, you know, iterate it, run things in my browser, it's actually not running locally on my computer at all. I didn't need to install Julia on my computer. I didn't need to do any configuration on my computer. I just needed to point my browser at this and it spun up a, uh, you know, a, a machine that's already provisioned exactly the way I need it for my workflow. Uh, and so this is a, a really nice, easy way to, you know, just from, from getting started, but also for, for complete life cycle management, you know exactly where things are and exactly what's, what's going on. Uh, and 
So the difference here, this is exactly the same Julia that you would potentially install on your own local computer. Uh, and in fact, from your own local computer, you can, within VS Code, also connect to Julia Hub to submit jobs that way, uh, or connect to your Julia Hub Enterprise. Um, the, the only difference here is you know, the ease of use and the, the ability to spin this up very quickly and easily. Um, so that is, and, and as far as the code development, it's all exactly the same Julia code. Uh, you can run this code locally on Julia Hub or on your Julia Hub cluster, you know, across many machines. And one of the extraordinarily powerful points of Julia is that you should get exact numerical answers from all three systems. Even though my local desktop is a Mac, even though I'm, you know, through Julia Hub, I'm connecting to Linux systems, even though, you know, I could potentially distribute this job across many, uh, many machines, I should get the exact same answers if I, if I use reproducible, you know, random number seeding and such. So that's an extraordinary strong point uh, for, for Julia and Julia Hub in general is that, you know, this is all the same code, uh, you know, the exact same, same things that you're running. Uh, and so that's how, how that can work. There's a question from Alexander at Janssen. Um, I don't know, BJ, if you can unmute and possibly answer this one. Uh, sure, just give me a moment. Thanks, the question please. regarding Pumas, uh, .jl, is it possible to optimize neural networks while optimizing the PK model? For example, if a neural network is estimating typical values for clearance and volume? Yes, uh, thanks for asking that, uh, Alexander. So uh, just in a few months from now, we are, uh, Pumas is uh, uh, in collaboration with Julia Computing is launching a new product called as Deep NLME which is essentially um, uh, nonlinear mixed effects models uh, embedded into uh, neural networks. And uh, in this instance, this, this sort of uh, uh, framework allows you to not only estimate parameters, but in fact, discover the structure of your models, discover covariate relationships that you have never imagined to see. So uh, this is something that is coming up very soon uh, and you'll be hearing quite a bit about this, but yes, we have uh, this coming up in Puma's system a few months from now. Awesome, thank you. Are, are there any further questions out there? We'd love to hear from you. Feel free to, to unmute and, and, uh, and ask your questions if you like. There's a question here from Jason Boyd. Yes, Jason. Uh, will there that's... be a separate package for, from the Pumas JL package? Yes, uh, Deep NLME is, uh, is a new package uh, that Pumas is putting. It's a new product that Pumas is putting out uh, that's going to be coming out pretty soon. It, it will highly depend on Pumas, but it is a completely separate tool. And because of the compute resources requirement when you're running uh, uh, large scale neural networks, you know, we, we actually leverage the power of Julia Hub for a lot of our deep NLME work. Uh, so uh, another question here asking, is it possible to run with your own local cluster through the Julia Hub environment? Uh, and that is something that we can potentially talk with you about. Uh, we are really targeting cloud first here. Uh, and uh, that, that is the, the path to the future. Um, but potentially, depending upon the constraints of your local uh, HPC center and such, uh, that may be a possibility, but we'll, we'd have to talk further about that. Uh, just because every HPC center, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, is, is very, very unique uh, in, in its requirements and capabilities. And I think you might have answered Andrilla's uh, question there, Matt, when, when you were talking yeah. uh, about Julia Hub and Julia, but um, if you wouldn't mind just going over that again, that, that'd be great. Sure, so Julia Hub is really just running Julia code, uh, the, the open source language. Um, you know, one of the, the powerful things here is, you know, especially once you start talking about 
uh, proprietary packages like Pumas um, that require a license. You, Julia Hub is a, able to have that built in uh, to uh, to its its system. Um, but besides that, it's exactly the same code. And there's no difference. And thank you, Alexander, for sharing that uh, deep NLME presentation by Chris Rakakis, uh, the winner of the Emerging Scientist Award from ACOP. Do we have any other questions out there? Here we go. Hmm. Ah, yeah, an awesome question there from uh, Jason Boyd asking about, you know, so I've, I've demonstrated kind of the UI, the user interface way of, of interacting with the jobs table here and, and getting this all available to you and asking, is there a programmatic way to do this? And the answer there is yes, exactly. There is where uh, that's precisely how I'm doing it through this UI here is I'm using a uh, what we call the Julia Hub client. Uh, now this is still under development uh, and we just need documentation for it, but we'll be releasing this and, and make this available to Julia Hub Enterprise uh, customers. Uh, but the ability to interface with Julia Hub uh, directly, this will should eventually be available to all, everyone as well. But the idea is, you know, you can authenticate in uh, and, and use uh, you know, connect to Julia Hub to um, to set your server and and get jobs and there's a you know way of of building uh, in in this Pluto notebook. I build up a, a table that I can can use in an in introspect directly. But of course, I'm just using code to do this, right? I'm just uh, calling Julia code, uh, embedding it inside of HTML and, and getting things uh, set up so that way I can nicely and easily select out the, the job that I want. Um, but this is using that programmatic access uh, to, to Julia Hub. We kind of build the APIs first and then, and then build the UIs on top of it. So this is all, of course, scriptable and, and available. And in fact, within dashboards, for example, you could kick off Julia Hub jobs. Uh, so you could decide to say, hey, let's start a Julia Hub job uh, and, and expose that to a, a user of a dashboard. Um, so that's how, you know, the, this is a, a full featured uh, system that allows you to do that. Awesome, Matt. Well, hello, can you hear me? Oh, yes. Go ahead. Uh, hi, you brought up a really interesting point there. And I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about the differences. I guess I'm wondering in terms of price and in setup of maybe something like a dashboard that you want up for an extended period of time mm -hmm. versus a job that will run, you know, some specified number of iterations for whatever you're trying to achieve. Um, what kinds of things should you consider, I guess, when, when looking at those two different kinds of projects? That is an awesome question. And thank you for asking it. We've kind of, we targeted Julia Hub and a lot of our initial development around really big, heavy compute tasks, right? That need potentially thousands of cores to do their jobs. Uh, and so if I go into my applications, for example, here and, and want to launch this dashboard that I demonstrated, right? I, I have it launch it already running, but I could launch a second instance or something like this. Currently, the smallest machine that we support running right now uh, is going to cost you $4 a day, which is not going to be what you want to use uh, to, um, to have a very long, long living service or uh, you know, be able to do this. So we're actually working on exposing the ability to select even smaller machines than a two core uh, eight gigabyte machine um, that would be cheaper and, and more cost effective here. Uh, so that's something that, that we're actively working on and, and actively figuring out how to do, potentially even sharing machines and such to make it uh, far more um, affordable for 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 tasks like dashboards, right? That don't need to do huge compute, that don't need to have very large resources. And and uh, to put a finer point on this, when I deploy this dashboard to Heroku, for example, I'm constrained with an environment that only has 500 megabytes of memory, uh, and I think only one mm -hmm. CPU or maybe even a half a CPU. It's kind of shared and 
and across, you know, not on a dedicated machine. Uh, that's not the way that you would want to deploy, for example, a, uh, a project with sensitive environment, sensitive uh, data or things like that. But it is really nice for, for you know, simple and easy tasks, particularly when it comes to teaching and such. And so that's, that's something that we're working on, building out the lower end of, of compute now as we go um, and, uh, you know, can, can do that. I don't know that we'll get rid of this this time limit thing here, but just simply because it's just really a, an awesome way of, of ensuring that you don't outspend your budget, right? That you don't forget about these things. I know I've forgotten to to shut down machines, and so of course you can can set these things up uh, to to have lots of uh, hours behind them and such. And so um, you know this is how you can ensure that uh, you. Um, you know, you don't overspend your budget and such. But yeah, that, that's something that we're actively yeah. working on to make this more affordable for small tasks. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Matt, I was wondering if you could just touch upon, I know you've talked about Julia Hub and kind of shown the workflows and things that are available. How about if someone wanted to actually use uh, Julia uh, inside of a Julia Hub enterprise account, uh, how would they go about setting that up? You know, data storage, that type of stuff. Um, could you explain that process for us, please? Sure, absolutely. So once it comes to a Julia Hub enterprise deployment, we work with you to you know set up your own dedicated server, set up your own uh, dedicated compute environment, uh, and that means that, for example, you have access to your own custom packages. So not only, for example, do open source packages pop up here. Uh, but additionally, you get access to private packages and, and all of your private packages that you're developing, all of your private models that you're developing are, are available to you here. Uh, you can actually see this directly. I have a, a demo version of Julia Hub Enterprise that we can go into and, and kind of poke at a little bit. It looks very similar, uh, but this is now Julia Hub Enterprise that allows me to I, uh, you know, use custom packages and, and set these things up. And I can then I go in and register packages to my custom company registry and, and get these up and running this way. So I can actually register my own packages, get them uh, set up within my own company. So that way anyone can use them and anyone can access them. As far as data goes, well, because this is cloud hosted, the, the best and, and uh, most uh, the most effective way to work with your data is to use a cloud store. Uh, and when you talk about AWS cloud stores and such, well, all it takes is a, a way of managing uh, what we call your secrets. Uh, so you can go in here and set up your AWS key and, and secret, or I forget what it's called, AWS secret. Uh, and, and add this in and now all your jobs will be able to access this and do so in a secure and, and validated way. So that way you know that uh, you're, you're accessing your data and it's available to you. Uh, of course, then when you're within your, your VS Code environment, uh, so you know, even whether you're on uh, Julia or on, um, uh, on Julia Hub, Dot com or on your Julia Hub Enterprise, you can simply upload data to your, your interactive environments just by dragging and dropping. Uh, so I can you know, grab some file from, uh, from, my, uh, from my desktop here, grab it, drag it over and copy it in and it'll, it'll copy it and get that up and running for us. Uh, so that is, you know, it's very, very simple and straightforward to, to upload data here. You just drag and drop it. And that's nice for interactive work. For your deployed models, we really want you to, to access a cloud store because that's going to be a validated way of making sure that you know the exact input, right? If it's accessing a file system, well, that, that might change over time. Whereas if you're accessing a cloud store, we can keep track of that. We know exactly what's going on there. Uh, and that's much more effective way of, of working with your data. 
Uh, and once my AWS key is set up, well, then I can use the AWS package just to, to download it and work with it here. Uh, it's a really awesome way to do that. And so that, of course, scales to many, many, many gigabytes and terabytes. And that's awesome to hear, Jason. Uh, we will certainly be connecting with you. Absolutely. Yeah, I don't know if you guys have like a, a user forum, but I think uh, something like a meetup, like uh, the the R groups have, is super useful. That's a great idea. We'll, we should uh, we'll work on that. We'll you know hopefully put something up on Julia dot com on Julia right. and and get that started. So thanks a lot, Jason, for the for the recommendation and good to hear. From yeah, you. I didn't realize there was a discourse, but uh, I'll try to connect to that. Yeah, there's a, a Puma's specific discourse. There's also a, a general purpose Julia language discourse. Uh, both of those are, are great spots. If you're using Puma's code, the, the discourse.pumas.ai is a great uh, resource. Or simply discourse.julialang.org is our, our general Julia users uh, discourse group. Uh, both of them are, are quite active and, and lots of uh, awesome people to collaborate with, uh, including us. Quick question there, Matt, about AI. What about AI? <laughs> what about it? Uh, the, so, you know, we've talked a little bit about how neural networks work. Uh, I recently gave a, a really cool talk that I had a lot of fun building uh, for the Splash conference that you can check out on how we're using the differentiable programming aspects of Julia to power projects like Pumas uh, and the, the different ways in which you can differentiate in particular through differential equations solves uh, allows you to uh, you know, build up and, and understand your systems significantly more, far more than I can talk about in the next minute. So encourage you to check out those, uh, uh, those, those talks. Uh, and, and on the subject of AIs, a uh, question about, is Chris Rikakis a robot? Unfortunately, he is not, because uh, if you were a robot, we could replicate him uh, and just copy him and paste him and, and get a, 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 whole, a whole army of Chris Rikakis clones. Uh, that, that would be awesome. I don't know how he does it. He is always awake, seemingly, and always coding. Uh, and, and he is a force of nature. So he is <laughs> largely uh, to thank for a lot of uh, the, the core science that, that we're able to leverage. Matt, if you don't mind, this is Viral here. I'll, maybe if I can chime in for a couple of seconds about the AI question. Sure. So uh, um, actually, uh, you know, so, so one of our papers that we submitted with Pfizer on QSP, well, you know, got the best abstract award this year. And maybe you'd already mentioned that. Um, which Chris was a co-author on. Yeah. So, uh, as a follow-on to that work, one of the things that we're doing is we have a product uh, in development called Neural Sim, and uh, Neural Sim is basically a package that builds surrogates of mechanistic models, like the ones that you have in QSP. So it can automatically train itself on the models and then sort of speed them up significantly if you're going to reuse them again and again and again often by factors of 100x or 1000x. So stay tuned and join us in a future seminar uh, to talk about neural sim. And yes, if you look at Matt's link there, you can probably learn a little bit more about that there and on the Julia Computing website. Yes. Thanks, Viral. Thanks for joining us and uh, providing that additional feedback. Is Are there any other questions? I see a couple things coming up, but... Uh... Um, it, it looks like we've run to the top of the hour and a little bit beyond. Um, I don't know if you have any parting words, Matt, or BJ, or Birol. I want to thank everyone for your attention and your questions. This was a great, great session, and, and thanks for being a part of it. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah okay. thank you. And of course, email us at sales at juliacomputing.com um, to get started on this journey. Thanks everyone. Certainly appreciate your time, Matt, BJ, Viral, and company and everyone uh, joining us here today. So thank you so much. Um, have a great weekend. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.